compiled or not compiled? Well, that's a tester's problem. Like, yeah. Are you out of your freaking mind? <laughs> well, it's a salary continuation program. Decide, <laughs> decide what you'd like to do because we're going to do this. You know, that's one of my jokes says, you never see me on a project going well. You know, you put me on the projects that aren't going well and that you want to go well. And then you find that coalition of the willing. Sometimes you really have to just give yourself freedom to ask dumb questions. You know, the tools you have affect the way you think about the problem. Hi, I'm Paul Berger, founder of Circle CI. I'm Edith Harba, CEO and co-founder at LaunchDarkly. And you're listening to To Be Continuous, a podcast about continuous delivery and software development. You can get in touch with us anytime at our Twitter handle, at ContinuousCast. The show is brought to you by Heavybit. To learn more, visit heavybit.com. And while you're there, check out their library, home to great educational talks from other developer company founders and industry leaders. Okay, so what is the thing that you like the least about continuous delivery? Uh, The thing I like least about continuous delivery is going through the painful cultural change to get everybody on that model, Mm -hmm. right? So I'm in Microsoft and we're Windows, and uh, you know the previous version of Windows was a three-year release where we planned for a year, we coded for a year, and then we took a year to stabilize and release. And it's very waterfally, very like three-year waterfall. Yeah, yeah. and uh, the model of like, hey, now we gotta go and and do it in small batches and quickly. And from the OS side, that's very hard. What we did was we broke up some teams and we're doing it like with the PowerShell team, trying Mm -hmm. to get into that model. And it is a painful thing. You know, you got to change your mindset. People want to stay to the past. Like, wait, how do I, what? And so that's the hard thing. I mean, Mm -hmm. once you're through the knot hole, it's a much better world, but getting from here to there is extraordinarily painful and not everybody makes it. Mm -hmm. And that's pretty painful. So now would be a great time to have our guest introduce himself. We're podcasting from Microsoft Build and we're so honored to have you with us today. Yeah, howdy. I'm Jeffrey Snover. I'm a technical fellow at Microsoft. I'm focused these days on, um, I'm the chief architect of the Azure infrastructure and management team. So it's a pretty wide set of responsibilities, but mostly I'm focused these days on both Azure Stack and of course management and PowerShell, which I invented. Yeah, Mm. so cool. So I'm so interested in what you're saying about this hard shift. So like I've heard about the three-year process. Yeah. How do you convince people to move from that? to continuous delivery. Yeah, well, it's hard, right? Uh, and they, they, a lot of times they didn't want to do it. But basically what you try and do is you try and find something that they can get their head around. So for us, one of the key things was a shift to nano server. So are you familiar with nano server? So well, for traditional, the, for the audience. traditional Windows server translates to about a 10 gigabyte VHD. Server core, the GUI list version, is about 6 gigabyte VHD. I initiated a very dramatic refactoring of the operating system called nano server, and that starts at about 400 megabytes. Mm-hmm. Windows server in 400 megabytes. Well, guess what? In order to run on that, you got to do dramatic refactoring. Part of this was to move from Windows PowerShell being .NET uh, framework based to being .NET Core based. Mm. So that was a dramatic refactoring and the team didn't want to do that, right? Because they knew they were competent and successful in this world and they had a group of customers that they knew and they knew how to give them the next set of things. And what we had to do is we said, yeah, I want you to not do those things, not meet those customers' needs Mm -hmm. as we make this change to develop something. And they looked and they're like, Boy, that's going to be really hard, and in the end, it's not going to be as good as this thing because mm-hmm. it's going to be a version one of a new thing, and I don't want to do it. <laughs> uh-huh. it. It sounds very much like the the innovator's dilemma. Yes, you know, keep keep doing what you're doing, or or break everything, and and maybe your revenue models as well in order to to get where the where the puck is going. Exactly, and so you do the traditional DevOps. What well, we in the community have all been learning, right? Mm-hmm. Find the coalition of the willing. Start small. Sometimes the coalition of the willing includes people who are willing to do work f- to keep their paycheck running okay, coming in. <laughs> yeah. But uh, but then when they get there and like, oh, hey, this is cool. They they get enthusiastic and build some momentum and build some success. Mm-hmm. And then you add to it, and add to it, and then at some point you just mandate the the change. And then they're like, oh, yay. In fact, so I did this at, uh, when I came to the company. We had this horrible division, like developers develop code and they checked it in. And like compiled or not compiled, well, that's a tester's problem. Oh, like, yeah. are you out of your freaking mind? <laughs> like, no, we're not going to do that. Like, here's the deal. Uh, on this project, 
everybody has to do unit tests. Mm -hmm. And like, well, that's a tester's job. It's like, well, right, right, right. it's a salary continuation program. Decide, <laughs> decide what you'd like to do because we're going to do this. And like, oh, they were all angry with me. And then mm -hmm. I had to explain, okay, wait a second. You got to write the test at the same time as the code. Well, no, I don't have time to that. I'll do it at the end. Mm -hmm. It's like, no, you're going to do it now. And it's like, okay. Oh, I guess I didn't explain. You got to run the tests <laughs> before you check in the code. And yes, they have to work. And, and wait, no, you have to run all the tests. Well, why do I have to, you know, I changed, changed his code and his test broke, not mine. I said, mm. well, did his test fail before you checked in your code? No. Then you broke the, anyway, <laughs> each one of those things was like this big crisis. Mm -hmm. And people were just not happy with me at all, right? Because they knew how to do things. But then it was like four or six months after I just did this, people came to me and was like, wow, you know, this is actually pretty cool. Every night we can self-host. We've never been able to do that. Mm -hmm. And uh, you go faster. So it, it feels a little like the, like the transition from sort of dev and ops to dev ops, yeah. where people used to have this ability, which is sort of a, a good and a bad thing, to, to throw it over the wall to, to ops. And so they had this benefit where they didn't have to deal with the, the opsy side of things. And I guess it comes with the, with the, with the upside of the, like, when you have to deal with the opsy things that you have new capabilities. Yeah. yeah. So you've pioneered both test-driven development and DevOps. Well, within a little sphere. Yes. Within a little sphere. <laughs> yeah. so I, and, then, and then you, you do it in a little sphere, and then you try and make it bigger and bigger. Yeah. So I know that a lot of people are still trying to make these same transitions. What's what's some advice? Like you already heard, I already heard, like get the coalition of the willing. Yeah. I mean, that's part of it. You know, we want to find something where, you know, a project that is a good profile, right? Something that's in trouble. You know, it's one of my jokes says, you never see me on a project going well. You know, mm -hmm. you put me on the projects that aren't going well and that you want to go well. So you want a, something that has an opportunity to, to improve or go faster, be better. Something where when you notice it, when you, uh, there is a change, you'll notice the change. And then you find that coalition of the willing. Often, like with the, the PowerShell to Linux, I uh, got a couple guys right out of college, and uh, they were Linux guys, and they were gung-ho and wanted a, a nice, meaty, hard problem that they could claim as their own. It's mm -hmm. like, I got something for you. And man, they just, they were rocking it. They did a great job. And then all of a sudden, people are like, oh, why, why are they getting all the attention? Why do they get mm -hmm. to you know, show off their stuff to the executives? How come they're going to, oh, how do I get part of that? <laughs> And uh, so then you grow. And then you do it a couple times. You know, it typically requires an executive sponsorship because you will have, let's be clear, when you embark on this, failures will happen. Mm -hmm. I just gave a talk where I talk about this difference between incremental change and transformative change. Yeah. Right? Transformative change, like incremental change, you know what you need to do. You just either have to work harder or whatever. Transformative change, you don't necessarily know how to get from here to there. Yes. Right? In, in incremental change, you're going to succeed. You know, in transformative change, you are going to fail, full mm -hmm. stop. And it's all about how you fail and learn and keep going forward. With the incremental change, you keep all your people. With transformative change, you lose people. Yeah, it's, it's funny. I was writing, um, I have a startup, and I was writing a board member yesterday about a change we'd done. And he said, well, are you moving forward? I'm like, well, we're moving. I don't yet know <laughs> if it's lateral or diagonal, but, like, we're moving. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and we know in physics, right, coefficient of dynamic friction versus the coefficient of uh, uh, static friction is much lower. So if you can get things moving, you can change the direction. Yeah, and, and it takes sometimes a little bit of time to see whether you're actually improving, but at least you're moving. Yes, mm. exactly. One of the one of the sort of tenets of, of startups is that the, the team that you start with isn't necessarily the, the team that you finish with. And I never, I never understood this when, when I, when I started startups. Like, you know, you want to try really hard to keep that that early team, and and you know, why must it be necessary that that the early team leaves? But once you realize that the way to do startups is is to have a complete transformative change at every stage. So mm. as soon as you you hit product market fit, you completely change into a company that is chasing traction. And then once you once you have some traction, you completely change into a company that's pursuing scale. And it's like those, those are major transformative changes for the company. And, and if you try to avoid them in order to keep things the same, to, to keep the, the early culture or the early people, then you risk being unable to transform and only being, you're, you're a company that's trying to scale that, that thinks like a pre-product market fit company. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a great way to phrase it. And sometimes people can see those changes and they have the skill to make the change. Yep. Sometimes yep. they can see it, but they don't have the skill and they, those are 
people who can gracefully exit, bring in a new team, mm -hmm. and then other people don't see the change, and right. that's all bad. I, I, I love the way that it's not about tools at all. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. I think it correlates very, very much to whether they've, they've had this situation before. Mm -hmm. um, and in, in, in some cases, when you know, the first time that they went through this transformation, they, and they may have ended up on, on the team that leaves and, and are, are bitter about it or, mm -hmm. or unhappy about it at least, but then they've seen that happen, they have several years to reflect and understand why, why it had to happen, and then the next time it happens, they, they might be on a different path in, in, in that transformation. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, you've been at Microsoft. I mean, you're, you must have seen several changes. Like, what? <laughs> Absolutely. How, how do you think Microsoft has changed in your time here? Uh, well, right. So when I came in, you know, it was gooey, gooey, gooey. And I was the guy who came in and said, we got to do command line interface. <laughs> that was a very painful experience, right? Mm -hmm. uh, they were not ready to hear that. I had one executive say, you know, tell me exactly what part of effing Windows is confusing you. <laughs> I mean, and, and I said, no, seriously, this is what is required. And uh, in, in, in order to work on it, I actually had to take a demotion. I did. Wow, I got demoted that. to work on PowerShell, and uh, it took me five years before I got my stripe back. Um, but by that time, they realized, hey, this really was important. Uh, this GUI was great when you got one machine or four machines, et cetera. Mm -hmm. But when we want to go manage data centers, we do need automation. And, you know, how do you, oh, I've got 500 mouse clicks. Like, how do I share that? Yeah. I don't know right, if you've right, ever figured right, this right. out. GUIs are antisocial. Yes. Mm -hmm. Oh, you got yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, Most yeah. people don't get that. Well, it's, I've, I've tried to do um, automated testing, like, through, you know, and it's, it's so painful. Exactly. If you have yeah, to yeah. click and then something changes, you're like, I can't click there anywhere. Yeah. So. And, you, and there's nothing you can share with people. Anyway, so that was a big change, going from GUI to command line interface. Why were you so passionate about it? Because I knew, well, I got hired in to, to solve their management problems, right? So basically, Bill was beating up all these teams and basically said, we need some outside help. Let's get in somebody who knows something about management. So that's why they reached out to me, and that's why he hired me. Mm -hmm. So... It's like, this is my job. And you cared enough that you got demoted for five years because you're like... Well, what had happened was, so I've been driving a bunch of management changes, and then I originally taken the Unix tools and made them available on Windows, and then it just didn't work, right? Because it's a core architectural difference between Windows and Linux. On Linux, everything's a, an ASCII text file, so anything that can manipulate that is a managing tool. Awk, grep, set. Happy days. Mm -hmm. I brought those tools available on Windows, and then they didn't help manage Windows because Windows is everything's an API that mm. returns structured data. Mm -hmm. So that didn't didn't help. Anyway, so I thought, well, hey, I came up with this idea of PowerShell, and I said, hey, we could do this better. And that idea it was clearly one of the best ideas I ever had. And I, I just, at the end of the day, said, well, you know what? I'm just going to view this like a startup. You're paying me a lot of money and, and backing my play to, to bring this technology to bear. So I was willing to accept that. Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, you know, here's the reality. You are the level you are, and then it gets recognized at the right time. So if, it, if they came in and hired me and they got it wrong, they hired me at too high a level, like that doesn't help me and it doesn't help them. So mm -hmm. if I'm a lower level, fine, I should be a lower level. On the other hand, if I'm at a lower level, in fact, I'm at a, a really a higher level, it met, takes a time, but it'll eventually rectify itself. In my case, it took five years before they saw that. So that was actually quite an expensive uh, <laughs> <laughs> little detour. But it, it rectified itself, and then I got my stripe back. I became distinguished engineer, and then technical fellow. You know, Microsoft has uh, over 120,000 employees. We only have eight uh, technical fellows that are focused in on products. So, mm. well, it's, it's, I, I, I feel like it's an honor just to talk with you. Because <laughs> please, no. I, so I'm interested in in PowerShell and a little bit in the uh, in the side of continuous delivery and, and how that yeah. has affected like a command line tools. So in the Unix world that, that I'm used to, you get an upgrade when you know every six months when, when Ubuntu releases a, a, a new version, which isn't necessarily a great thing because you you write scripts for the older version of tools and, and then things change and, and, and so on. There's always a little bit of awkwardness when when, when you're upgrading. Mm -hmm. uh, I wonder I wonder what that's like in the uh, uh, in the Windows world, where where you've got PowerShell, you're trying to automate these sort of uh, structured data, and it's like does the structured data change? What, what do your PowerShell scripts do? What, what does PowerShell itself do? Et, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, so one of the great benefits of this is that uh, the structured data in APIs is a stronger contract. Mm -hmm. I mean, basically what happened, here's the heart of PowerShell. It's just as simple as this. And I said, what is the Unix compositional model? And it's, it's A, pipe to B, pipe to C. That's the heart of it. And I asked myself, well, why do they do that? 
And I came up with the answer. Oh, because A didn't do what you wanted to do, <laughs> right? Because otherwise you just type A. Mm -hmm. Like, well, that's obvious. But then I asked the next dumb question. Sometimes you really have to just give yourself freedom to ask dumb questions. Mm -hmm. I said, well, why didn't do A do what you wanted to do? And there were two answers, the traditional Unix answer, small tools, composition, right, right, right. da 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 We all know that story. But it, when you really drilled into it, I realized that there was another answer. And the other answer was this, that A bound three separate steps into one. It, A, got a set of objects, mm -hmm. it processed those objects, and then it output the objects as text. And then, because A didn't do what you wanted to do, what we're really saying is, I didn't get the objects I want, or I didn't process them the way I want, or I didn't output them the way I want. Oh, if it did, I'd mm -hmm. just type A. So when you pipe it to B and then C, what you're really doing is you're taking the text output to reverse engineer your way back to the original objects to do one of those steps differently. Yep, yep. And all I said was, just put the pipeline in each one of those steps and deal with the objects. Move it earlier. Yeah, yeah move it yeah. earlier. It's smaller. That's why we call them command lets. They're small. You put the pipe, it's a pipeline of objects. And with the objects, you know, there's none of the prayer based parsing. Mm -hmm. now, some people are good at this. I'm not one of those people. You cut off three lines, or is it two lines? Yeah. 27 columns, is that a tab, or is it 28? Oh, I'm just horrible at all that stuff, right? But when I see, hey, something's got a name, it's like, give me the name. Handle count? Give me the handle count. And uh, it's a much tighter, uh, more resilient contract. Mm -hmm. And as you add things, you know, add it, now a property, an object has more properties, that's a, that's a fine change. You know, it's like adding things to an XML document. That's a contract that goes really well. Mm -hmm. You know, whereas adding things to the output of a, of a text, it's like, oh, now what do I do? I, I love that story because you basically, you were, do you know the theory of five whys? Yeah, yeah. So that's what you're doing. You're like, well, why is it this way? Why is it this way? Why? And then, and then by, by that, you suddenly got to the real answer. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. It's interesting how the world where PowerShell exists is, is one in which there isn't a culture of writing a massive amount of scripts. Correct. So, so let's say in, in Unix, like the, the build system is all, is all scripted in Bash or, or similar, similar uh -huh. enough to Bash. And so I, I wonder how that, how that affected like the, the users of, of PowerShell and what ended, up, what ended up happening with that. Yeah, so actually it's been the same sort of thing. It, it was not, you know, it's been a, a small community that's been growing and growing. And, uh, you know, honestly, some of those things, some of those uh, examples were not great steps forward. We had one partner that you know, we were very hardcore on verb dash noun. Somebody thought that Citrix was a verb. Turns out it isn't. <laughs> so you know, we had to like, okay, we're going to have to enforce a little bit of rules here. So yeah, because the, the great thing about the Unix culture is because it's been there forever, mm -hmm. people all know the rules of the road and you don't have to teach the rules of the road. They just know it because that's the rules of the road. Mm -hmm. And uh, whereas here, there's got to be a lot more active evangelism as people get it. But indeed, it's been growing, you know, so like Azure Stack. Mm -hmm. right? So Azure Stack, that's where we take the heart of the public cloud, most of the services, and allow them to run on customers' sites starting in as little as four nodes. I'm writing that, you know, the deployment, the configuration, the operations, the patch and update, uh, it's written all in PowerShell. Mm -hmm. So we got like hundreds of thousands of lines of PowerShell code. Right. And as we do something that large, then that has then brought about the next evolution of the tool. If you ever read the Moda Manifesto, uh, where I sat down and I said, here's what we're doing and why we're doing it. I talked about something that you would recognize. It's like I talked about the need for a single tool that could uh, be used by developers and operators. Yes. Right? Because when operators get in trouble, developers couldn't help them because they talk in different languages. When operators, you know, you just couldn't collaborate well if you had different tools. So explicitly in 2001, wow. addressed this as a problem that, need, that we sought to address. This is way before the word DevOps was ever... Exactly, man. DevOps before DevOps is cool. Uh. Yeah, go read it. It's, it's out there. Monad Manifesto. Anyway, the reality is that in version one, we focused largely on operators, and then step by step, we've been increasing the more developer focus. With version five, put the pedal to the metal on that, where we introduce classes, we introduce test frameworks, unit test frameworks, introduce a script analyzer, uh, integrate in with Visual Studio and Visual Studio Code with rich editors. So really, uh, you know, you can start off and do quick, ad hoc, dirty, bash style scripting with dollar sign args. Yeah. You can be formal, you can be very formal, and now you can write systems code all using the same tool. 
it's interesting that the the pattern on on Unix is is you start writing it in in some dirty bash, and then you get you get thirty lines in and realize you're completely over your head, and so you rewrite it with in Python. Uh huh. Uh, or you oh, know, in the old day, Perl, today Python, and then it doesn't work. So then you write it in C. Yeah, funny. That's I think terrifying. I, I think I, uh, that might even be in the manifesto. That okay. was the story I told over and over again. You start off something, and then the tool. Uh, my joke was, well, it was a joke, but it's true. Everything's greatest strength is its greatest weakness. Unix's greatest strength is this compositional model. Now here's the reality: it's also a weakness because what happens is when you have the shell. And then, oh, well, I need something. And instead of like adding it to the shell, they went and added awk and set and grep. And then when that didn't do what we needed to do, well, instead of fixing awk, set, or grep, you went and added pearl, et mm -hmm. cetera, et cetera. So the, the not so friendly joke is to say, well, it's actually an anthology of failed tools, mm -hmm. right? As each failed tool then brings about the other one. And what I said was, hey, we have the opportunity to take a look at the sequence of tools and then produce the one that can address the wide range of things, right? And so, the, again, the point is that had someone said, hey, Shell doesn't need this, I need this, why don't you add it to Shell, uh, Shell would have been a much, you know, right. would have been a much richer well, tool. The, the, the way that I think about Bash and, 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 and Unix Shell and, and so on is, is that these programs are functions. Mm -hmm. So like awk and, and sed and, and grep and so on are functions in, in Bash's world. Yep. And it, it passes parameters via standard in and, and it parses things by standard out and exceptions are thrown by the return value. But then there's no room for something like Perl in this model. Mm -hmm. right? Because ne now you've got this weird DSL that, that, that's like a function that you can call and it makes no sense at all. Those are weird DSLs too. Sed's a DSL. Oxa DSL. Right, ex ex explicitly. Ba but Bash the tiny language the, movement. Bash thinks of them as functions. Uh, well, same thing with Perl. You know, Perl, it X, it's a binary with arguments. I see what in. you're saying. So, like, you're saying that essentially you can write complete sed scripts or complete aux, aux scripts. Yeah. Right. In, in the world that, that, that I live in, let's say the post. 1999 <laughs> world. I, I've never seen anyone write a, write an awk script or a, or a sed script. There you go. I got into it pretty early. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I was originally a, a Unix uh, manager. Mm. Yeah, so I, you know, I did learn Unix uh, as a storage technology doing factory control systems. So that's why, like, all the stuff about you know the Japanese quality movement. Man, we were living that stuff. Oh, yeah. interesting. Yeah. yeah. You, you Phil were... Cosby, quality is free. Deming, Taguchi, yeah, yeah, I mean, literally factory floors doing disks. And it, we had a Unix-based uh, uh, factory control system. Mm -hmm. Wow. So you saw one big shift, which was getting PowerShell out to the hands of Mashes. Yep. What, what was the next big shift you saw after that at Microsoft? Oh, yeah, so going to that, really there was the long period and the new leadership under Sacha. I mean, mm -hmm. that really, it's the real deal, and it's such a dramatic difference. He's such an open leader. And basically what he did was when he came on board, he said, hey, everybody, get out of your offices. Get, stop talking to get, one another. Get out of the building. Mm -hmm. Go talk to the customers. Because the world had changed in the, in the bomber years. And, Absolutely. And Microsoft, I guess, had not. Yeah, exactly. You know, right. we're very good at at doing a great business job with the assets that we had. Yeah. And uh, but what Sachin had seen was that the world had changed, and that our relationship with the world needed to change. Mm -hmm. So he said, "Get out of the offices. Go talk to customers. Find out what they need to be successful, and give it to them." Mm -hmm. This is that simple. He says, "Don't worry about the money. Do not worry about the money. If you're making customers successful." We will figure out how to monetize it. Don't worry about that. We got plenty of, of room to grow there. From and the outside, I feel that a lot of my peers who, 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 would, who would have been hardcore, never work at Microsoft, never interested in the Microsoft stack, never any of those things. When, when, when Satya came in, it was like, oh, Microsoft's an interesting company again. I would, I would totally go work at Microsoft or I'd totally be acquired at Microsoft. Yeah. Yeah, well, actually, I, I didn't want to go to work for Microsoft. When they got the call, I was working at Tivoli, and I basically said, yeah, I'm not that interested in talking to you, because, mm -hmm. you know, big evil empire. I was a Unix guy. Of course, yeah. And uh, it turned out that I, there was an executive, Dave Thompson, who I'd known, and I just thought the world of this guy, and he said, hey, Jeffrey, I, I'd like you to come talk to me. I was like, well, okay, I'll talk to you. And so then when I came and talked to the people, the people were just amazing, just incredibly high IQ, passionate people. And so my joke was I never joined Microsoft, I joined Dave Thompson, so. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
But yeah, then the observation was that, hey, the company's very good at identifying the things it's bad about at, right? Have the courage to admit these things and then put together a plan to address it. So that at the time, the manager was terrible. I said, okay, well, if, you, if I can help fix that, and there's so many uh, units out there, you know, you have an opportunity to have a huge impact. Anyway, so the new leadership under Satya is just great. You know, that whole, that iconic picture of Satya against the background, Microsoft hearts Linux, right? Oh, yeah. yeah. Just, just set the tone, and it's real. You yeah. Know, it's real. I love your story about moving from a three-year cycle to continuous delivery. What were some of the effects you saw on the team once it had gone through? Oh, well, once we got through, all of a sudden, you know, uh, like we're doing this now. I think the best of these projects is I mentioned to you that when we went to Linux, we had a great uh, editor on Windows that we couldn't bring over. So we had to do a new project, Visual Studio Code. Now, on this one, with PowerShell, we're op bringing it to Linux and we're open sourcing it but I'm open sourcing version six, right? So there's not a whole lot of opportunity for people to say, hey, the fundamental design should be X, Y, or Z. Mm -hmm. With Visual Studio Code and the PowerShell enhancements, there we started that project in the open uh, with the community. We have a Microsoft full-time maintainer and a community maintainer, right? And so that's being done in the open. And these guys are just going quick. You know, they're on Twitter, they're on GitHub, and as people respond, they're coding and they're going fast, and the community loves them, and they love the community. And is that people adapting, or is that sort of bringing in fresh blood who, who already understands the GitHub ecosystem and, and how to be Linuxy and, and open Yeah, no, he, he adopted it. Oh, yeah. interesting. Yeah, he was uh, a system center what, guy. What was that like? Well, you know, the tools you have affect the way you think about the problem. Mm -hmm. So one of the biggest challenges with GitHub is, hey, I got to think about the problem differently. And everybody does that. In fact, I should get you a picture of this. We have this, uh, we're now one of the largest uh, projects we have, Windows, is moving over to Git. Okay? Mm -hmm. And so there are these posters up. As Wait, Windows is moving over to Git? Oh, maybe I shouldn't announce that. Is it, is it moving over to GitHub or just Git? Git. Okay. Yeah. Oh, that, would, so, that would have been amazing. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I thought that's what you were saying. Okay, so they're driving all this exciting. education and training, and there's these posters on the wall called the five stages of get, right? So there's, mm -hmm. the, there's the denial, <laughs> and then there's the bargaining, and the <laughs> anger, and the acceptance, and the, oh, this is great. Mm -hmm. And so that, that kind of sums it up. I should get you that poster. It's yeah, pretty that, awesome. That sounds cool. What's, what's the bargaining stage like? Maybe I could go to a different project that keeps using my old tools. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe this will fail and, and we'll go back. Um, <laughs> what's the anger stage? What the hell? <laughs> you know, yeah. I think there's always that. Everybody's very passionate about delivering customer value. And so sometimes, and this is great for, for your audience too, you're so passionate about that, it's sometimes hard to accept the, that in order to do that, maximally over time, you got to stop and, and change the, the mm -hmm. infrastructure to work on your tooling. Because you know, hey, here's the next set of things I could do, but you're not going to do them in order to do something. And then the first few versions of that aren't as good, mm -hmm. but then, boom, you could do better yeah. after that. You, you yeah. have this problem where, where your worldview... Like every, every time you hear something from a customer, you take it on board and you sort of wedge it into your worldview. And it's like, oh, we can, we can slot this here. Mm -hmm. But the customer has a completely different worldview. And what you need to do over time is like get out of your worldview and figure out how you take all the stuff you're already doing to the worldview that the customers have instead. Yeah. yeah, that's the heart of the one of the big challenges is, mm -hmm. you know, stop thinking of yourself as successful and patting yourself on the back. Yeah. Get out there and find out where the real pain is and have the courage to address that pain. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I heard um I heard a horror story about a three year project where, you know, they got about two years into it and they realized that this feature was just not gonna work out in the field, but everybody had too much invested in it. Mm -hmm. So they shipped it anyway. They're like, Well, we can't kill it now. Uh-huh. And it's just like they weren't thinking anymore about the customer. They were thinking it's too late. Yeah, well, in their careers and their... Mm. If you were to be in that situation, I'm not sure I could honestly tell you to do it differently. Like, are, are you going to disappoint like half the team and, and people quit? I've, and I've killed features. I've killed releases. Two years in. We were like four or five months into release and we had to kill that entire release because the CEO said, hey, this direction is not working. Mm-hmm. And I remember how painful it was. I literally had like specs, we had half written code, and we had to delete it all. There you go. You know what? Smarts is pretty common. Courage is pretty rare. 
and it mm. was it was the right thing to do, but it was it was hard. Mm. Yeah, because you do lose people. So you're on Azure Stack now. Yeah. So what, what, t tell us a little bit about what Azure Stack actually is. Yeah, so basically the heart of it is take the, the core of Azure, and this is the ability, and we do it by scenarios, so IaaS and PaaS, the ability to write cloud applications, take the things required to do that, and then run it on customers' data centers. Mm -hmm. Now a lot of people then hear that and they say, oh great, I keep doing what I'm doing and, and I can call it a cloud. No, <laughs> it's not the deal. It is an integrated system. So you should think about it like the cloud equivalent of a storage area network. So a storage area network, you pick a vendor and you pick a capacity. This company, this size. Mm -hmm. That company then rolls it in, they do the systems integration, you know, installation, probably take a day, day and a half, and then you use it, right? Mm -hmm. And now what you're doing is you, with a SAN, you use SMB or NFS, and then there's a custom fabric administration experience where you just say, yeah, here's how I manage the, the storage. Same thing's going to happen with Azure Stack. You're going to roll it in, configure it, and then you're going to use the portal and you're going to get PaaS and IaaS, and then there's a custom admin experience, right? And that admin experience is, has a light that says replace a disk or a light that says replace a server or add a server. And at no time do you say, okay, what's the admin password? I'm going to like log in and, and uh, I'm going to install my security agents on there. Or mm -hmm. I'm curious as to how you're doing DHCP. Like, no, no, no. Internals are internal. You don't do oh, mess with that. Yeah. Because right, here's the model. What we're trying to do is we're trying to help people drive their digital transformation. Mm -hmm. That's about having developers and operators work together to deliver the things that drive the business forward. Business applications responding to customers. No company, I guarantee you, no company is, sells more shoes or puts more people in airplanes because their IT can manage you know, DNS better mm -hmm. than the other guys, right? Let's say for startups right, yeah. who, who, who are selling into this world, I feel that's a, that's a Microsoft luxury that uh -huh. you can sell a black box and say, no, no, you know, you're going to change your corporate IT policies to you know, you now deal with this black box. But I know as a, as a startup, if we were going in, we'd say, no, no, it's a black box. You can't run your your virus checkers or you can't go through your corporate security checklist to like pen test something or or get access to the database to verify something. They would say no. But I guess as, as Microsoft, there's, there's a lot more ability to sell blacker boxes. Oh, I see. A, a startup selling that. Yeah, absolutely. Right. Yeah. And a lot of this has to do with confidence, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. then, yeah. I mean, we're, we're doing, it's like security. This thing is wonderful from a security standpoint. I'm sure. And when people go and they say, hey, I've got to go take my instance and get uh, certified, we have all the documentation from a technology site. Certification is people, process, mm -hmm. and technology. Like HIPAA or PCI or that, exactly. that Exactly. Yeah. From the technology stamp, we'll have all that documentation that you can, you know, filled out for you. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Wow. Oh. Yeah, it's very cool. Oh. So, as someone from the uh, linux -y world, right? So I, I feel you had a really good pitch there for, for IT administrators. Uh -huh. And, you know, comparing it to SANS and, and SMB and, 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 and Fabric and that sort of thing. In my world, the, the way that people are, are getting this sort of the on-prem equivalence is they're going to like AWS VPCs. Mm -hmm. So how does this sort of compare? Wait, VPCs are... Uh... Virtual private clouds. Oh, uh-huh. So it's like Amazon is running it, but within your own sort of firewalled group, and, and mm -hmm. it's, it's like your own data center, but in, in the Amazon cloud. Mm -hmm. I, I, Wait, so so where, where do the servers actually reside? The, in, in Virginia, like the rest of the cloud. Yeah, yeah. so here's the thing. The, here, <laughs> so the question is, what, <laughs> what <laughs> the are cloud, they? The cloud is actually it's, a it's, it's a bunch of computers in Virginia. That's, that's the cloud. Yeah. So like, that wouldn't work for like a submarine, right? Right, okay. Right? So uh, Azure Stack works for disconnected and edge scenarios, mm -hmm. right? So imagine a cruise ship that is occasionally connected, but when, you know, when it's in dock, it has connectivity, but then when it's out, in, out of port, it, it never doesn't. never occurred to me that a cruise ship might have a... Oh, they have multiple data centers. Right, right, right. You know, right, all right. The, the point of sales systems and the customer loyalty mm. programs and the, uh, you know, gaming stuff. Yeah, yeah that's not even getting to, like, na the actual navigation. Exactly. Or, like, yeah. fuel, fuel, fuel consumption. Yeah, they have multiple redundant data centers mm. on a cruise ship. So, yeah, there's that or there's gravity, right, whether it's uh, data gravity or compute gravity. So imagine, uh, imagine a factory floor. Right, mm -hmm. factory floor. You're gonna uh, manage a, you get a bunch of sensor data and then control robots. You do not want internet connectivity in that loop, right? 
you want to mm. always be controlling your robots, right? You mean from a latency point of view or a security point of view? Uh, from a from a just reliability standpoint, mm-hmm. right? Occasionally, D- some DDoS attack, somebody's yeah, region yeah, goes yeah. down, something goes wrong with the internet. You can't mm-hmm. control your factory floor. That's a bad day. Yeah. Now the latency is ad- absolutely another issue. That's the edge scenarios. So we have some customers that are very interested in this because they got a ton of data and they need to manage that data and react to it with absolute low latency. Now the interesting thing about this, what we're seeing a lot of interest in is, yeah, I want to do that, but I actually have a number of those sites. So I want to do that processing and then get aggregate data up into a public cloud to do cross-site big data analytics. Mm -hmm. And then the third is regulatory requirements. I must have my data here, mm-hmm. right? So we got one vendor who's doing a public cloud application for all their associates throughout most of the world. But then there are certain geographies where that's not allowed. So they're taking exactly the same application, then they're going to run it on Azure Stack in those countries so that they compute and the data stays there. So those are the three scenarios, sort of disconnected, the, mm-hmm. the durable scenarios. Disconnected and edge, Regulatory. Oh, and then the third is is you know modernizing things. So imagine you've got a mainframe and you want to <laughs> get off that mainframe, whether it's a real mainframe or it's a legacy Oracle system. Yeah. You want to put a modern front end in front of that thing, and you want to put it next to it, right? Don't ship us your mainframe. We're not taking you know we're not putting it in our data centers. Yeah. We'll give you Azure Stack. You can put it right in front of that. So. I feel like a, a major transition in the modern, let's say the modern microservices world uh, yeah. that we're in, is that is that a bunch of microservices you don't you don't write yourself. Mm-hmm. So you know, the, 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 there's all these services that the Azure provides, like the, the the AI stuff, image recognition. Google and Amazon has all these, and all the startups have you know a, a, a particular API that does a particular thing, like background checks. Mm-hmm. Uh, maybe is a good example. How does that ecosystem exist in yeah. the in the Azure Stack world? That's what's so exciting is because you get this one. Azure ecosystem. Because it's the same APIs and the same services, most of the things that you find in the Azure uh, marketplace, Mm -hmm. you'll be able to, in fact, that's the model, is you syndicate your marketplace with the Azure marketplace. You 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 syndicate them. Yeah, you basically make a, it's like a GitHub uh, branch, right? You say, okay, uh, I'm I'm here and here are the parts that I want now, and then people use yours. So you always have control over which versions you're offering to your tenants, but you're getting them from the Azure marketplace. I think I'm a little confused here. So all, all, all these services that are currently available in, in Azure Cloud are going to be available in some sense? Okay, yeah, I, no, I understand the confusion. So there's two flavors of these microservices, right? So the first are the native uh, Azure services, mm-hmm. and there we have a subset of those that will be available, yeah. and those are the core things that most things are built on. Yeah. And then there's the long tail. Right. And so, for instance, Content distribution network mm-hmm. on four nodes. Probably never going to bring that one down to four nodes. But uh, like uh, container service, that's going to be available shortly after GA. So we start off some, you know, with the core set, and then we'll grow that. You know, start so working I, on the long tail. I guess tail. I'm interested more in the in the sort of the managed services. So you, some sort of like deep learning as a service thing, yeah. where where there's there's a uh, hundred people who sit in one building and like that is the product that they build. Uh-huh. How, how, do, how do people who use Azure Stack interact with that? Yeah, that one, so it'll be on a case-by-case basis. Mm-hmm. But the things I was mentioning to you uh, are managed services, right? So Blob, Table, Q, right, those see, will I be see. managed yeah. by your fabric administrator. Gotcha. And what about the ones that can't be brought down? Yeah, they're, you access them in the public cloud. Gotcha, so yeah. it's just, same as you're normally doing, you're just... You're, you're making that API call from your Azure Stack instance. Yeah, exactly. And so okay. what we're doing is we work with the marketplace to find out what are the things that uh, matter the most. Mm-hmm. So concretely what we did was we took a look at the Azure Gallery, and these are solutions, right? So these are solutions that say, hey, I want to have these many VMs, and I, you know, here's the, the content, and I'm going to consume these services, et cetera. And we saw what they need to be successful, and that defined the version one of Azure Stack. Mm-hmm. So what that means is as you go to these you know, solutions in the marketplace, and you pick one of them, uh, an e-commerce site or a, you know, elastic search or whatever, you take those things, you deploy them, those are just going to work. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then we'll scale that out over time, adding more and more services. Okay, so similar question. As someone who, who has had a product that, that we transitioned to on-prem, mm-hmm. it was incredibly difficult to make it reliable. And so like, how have you guys gone about that? Like, How, how is it that, that you can take 
this you know, set of huge services that, that, that have dozens of people working on them and that uh -huh. I presume are unreliable because they're distributed systems and put it in a box that... Oh, okay. So let's talk about that. That there's, is reliable, I guess. There's two flavors of... So the heart of Azure Stack is consistency with Azure. Mm -hmm. Now, let's put our architect's hat on. How do you achieve consistency? There are two paths to consistency. Mm -hmm. One is compatible. Definition of compatible is different. Mm. Okay. The other path to consistency is the same. As much as possible, whenever I have a choice, it's consistent because it is the same. Mm -hmm. Some things, I can't be the same. So if you talk to Rasinovich and you ask him, hey, Mark, how many uh, servers does it take to start a storage stamp? Mm. He'll tell you, mm, about 800. Okay? <laughs> Turns out, not many people are interested in a proof of concept with 800 <laughs> servers. Yeah. So there, what we had to do is we had to take the lessons and design patterns and it be inspired by those and put those technologies into Windows Server. So that's our scaled out uh, storage spaces. And so that's working really quite well. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like it's, it's a reliable thing that you can mm -hmm. just install and, and oh, no but human to your has point, to. Uh, so what we have is we will mirror the Azure, you're right, with the say, hey, some of these services are not reliable. They're designed mm. to not be reliable. Right. Some there's of them keep up because there's someone who looks at the console and presses the right button at the right time. Okay, there's that, but then before that, they are intrinsically designed to take advantage of the unreliable nature of systems, right? I see. So there, what we're doing is we're mirroring the Azure scale model. The Azure scale model, you've got a single arm application resource manager that multiplexes all your, your REST APIs. Then you have regions, and then you have scale-out clusters, and then with each scale-out cluster, you have however many servers you want. In version one, we have one region, one scale-out cluster, four to 12 nodes. Mm -hmm. As we expand, the first thing we will do is to expand to have multiple regions. Why multiple regions versus multiple scale-out clusters? The answer is this. Multiple regions is how some of these solutions address the issue that you mentioned. Mm -hmm. Just to say, hey, I want to have a fault domain that is large, like this building might go down. So if it's <laughs> hope, too, hope, hopefully not right now. Yeah, <laughs> not this one. <laughs> but you know, if a building goes down, I still want to have something working, right? So if if you have two racks next to each other, that doesn't do it. Doesn't mm -hmm. keep the fault domains farther apart. So that's why we're choosing that multi-region gotcha. as the next step of increment. It's interesting. It's the thing you 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 immediately went to talk about was the sort of distributed systems reliability, yeah. as opposed to you know we we, we took a thousand people and we we worked out every single bug and, and tried to make it so that... Right, yeah, yeah. I mean, obviously. Well, it's, it's the TCP versus SNA model, right? Right, right? SNA tries to say, I got reliability at the lowest layer, mm -hmm. therefore you can everything can be simple above. TCP yeah. said, I will have failure, yeah. and I will deal with the higher, and yeah. it's so much cheaper. But by the way, to your point, uh, it is one of the biggest challenges I have. Indeed, in Azure, I have big teams managing those services. And when I take those things, I've got to transform that into a world where it's very simple to do. Yeah. And turns out that's hard. Yeah. yeah. There's, there's no getting around that one. Sounds like a fun challenge, though. Yeah. You said something before about deciding where to build versus buy and simplify. Yeah. About how do you make that decision? Uh, it's always a judgment call. Always a judgment call. You know, basically that's the, you always want to build the things that differentiate you and then buy the things that don't. That's yeah. the heart of it. That's the old Jeffrey Moore crossing the chasm model. Yeah, yeah. I, I love that book, by the way. Yeah. yeah, he's a great thinker. Yeah, well, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, do you have any final thoughts or things? You, I mean, I feel like I got uh, 30 years of history. And, yeah, of knowledge. <laughs> yeah, like, <laughs> I feel like we could talk for four more hours, but... um. Yeah, no, I'd just say that, you know, DevOps, uh, you know, talk about transformational change. And the thing about these transformational changes is that they're very painful. But the reason why you have the courage to go through these transformational changes is because at the other side of that transformational change, you're going to be in a much better place. You're going to be driving your business forward. Your customers are going to be happier. People working on, people who have adopted DevOps. And the thing that struck me, I went to Enterprise DevOps, and I saw these people from like what you might think of as old, dusty, mm -hmm. you know, companies up there, you know, middle-aged guys, like, full of vim and vigor and like so excited mm -hmm. and they're like yeah you know my career you know I was, I was dialing it in for years and years and years and then they talked about this deva I don't know and it's wonderful and there's just it, it is it is a great experience 
to go through these changes and succeed and drive your business forward and have happy customers. It's worth the pain. So I encourage your listeners to go through it if they haven't already. Yeah, well, then, then I have one more follow-up question. So like, okay. you, you saw, you know, command line, test-driven development, DevOps. What's the next big change? Well, here's the gotcha. So I'm an architect. My job's to answer these questions. This is the most exciting period in the history ever because in the past we all sort of knew what things were and then you'd have a big change. But right now, every single layer of the technology stack is going to going revolution. Yep. Revolution in the silicon, revolution in the systems design, revolution in memory, Optane, storage class memory, revolution in networking and storage and application design, in IP, in relationships. I mean, every single, it's all moving, all at the same time, all having revolutions. So, you know, getting that right, figuring out the right thing to do will be difficult, but that's but fun. my job. Exactly, it will be fun, it is fun. Awesome, thank you so much for, yeah, for coming so in. Much, this was right. awesome. It's been a pleasure. Thanks for listening to this episode of To Be Continuous, brought to you by Heavybit and hosted by me, Paul Bigger of Circle CI, and Edith Harbaugh of Launch Darkly. To learn more about Heavybit, visit heavybit.com. While you're there, check out their library, home to great educational talks from other developer company founders and industry leaders. 